Um, so if I could ask Katie if you would mind introducing yourself and then um, Dan. Sure. My, oh, there we go. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you, Naomi, for the invite, and you know, it's nice to meet you in person. Um, uh, I am the Deputy Vice President for Animal Rescue at the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and um, I uh, have been involved with marine mammal strandings for longer than I care to say, but, um, uh, almost 30 years now, uh, and with 25 of that being here uh, in Massachusetts and mainly on Cape Cod. So, uh, I'm pleased to be here to kind of give you a little glimpse into the, the modern day world of, of stranding. Well, you've already kind of heard from me a lot, but um, I'm Dan Rinelli, and uh, I'm so pleased to have had this opportunity to show this work here and thank Naomi and the museum for uh, having that happen. It's always where, I, it's, it's the place I've always wanted the work to be shown. Uh, right? I'm an artist. Uh, I'm a, f a fallen professor uh, from Boston University. I retired about seven years ago, but retirement for an artist just means I get to go to the studio more. Uh, so. so I'm going to ask uh, Dan and Katie each to talk for about five minutes uh, about their work, um, and then I'll ask some questions. Um, sort of get a discussion moving, and then we'll open it up as well to you all in the audience. So hopefully we can have a great conversation about this work and about the contemporary issues that it points to. So um, Daniel, if I could ask you first to talk a little bit about what inspired the project and what it's been like working on this over a 30 plus year period. Yeah, I thought I'd, I'd start by um, reading an excerpt from my essay in the catalog, which is actually the journal uh, entry that I made the night of the stranding in 1991 that I was present at, which as I mentioned in my talk, was the catalyst for the show. So bear with me, it's not, I'm not gonna read a lot. Um, September 10th, 1991, 8.30. I couldn't see anything from the road, but a few clusters of people up on the marsh and another group out on the black mud flats I walked past the first group through the knee-high eel grass down to the cove in Wellfleet where 24 whales had stranded themselves on the pre-dawn low tide. The blackfish, as these whales are sometimes known, were completely out of water and scattered in four or five little pods, hubbles really, their heads many times pointing to one another and in toward the center of the huddle, as if to discuss their next move or perhaps to console each other. Both experienced cetacean rescuers and inexperienced volunteers were out on the flats spilling seawater on the backs of the whales. Many of the animals were also smeared with mud, drying to nearly the same grayish black color as their skin. The mud was drying quickly in the, in the steady breeze and bore the streaky finger marks of the hands that had spread it. Their torsos smeared with primitive war paint. The whales seemed at times like huge, awkwardly positioned, three-dimensional monochromatic finger paintings of whales, vigorously rendered by children. Coming upon two dozen whales lying near death in the mud claws deeply at one's sense of ecological guilt. It is a sorrowful sight, different in kind than the ubiquitous roadkill deaths we whiz, whiz by at 60 miles an hour. These whales seem to be dying somehow because of my sins and those of my forebears. The whale nearest the shore is a small juvenile already dead and staring vacantly over an open mouth filled with square white teeth. The whales are mostly quiet, but every few minutes, a shuddering exhalation emits from one of the animals, a resonant, almost bellowed breath that seems to carry a mournful tone of resignation, suggesting the animal knows its probable fate. Tending to the animal when it exhales, you also feel the humid breath that is like a warm, feathered cylinder of primordial air. The whale's expiration become part of my inspiration, deoxygenated air swirling through my own lungs before I cough it out. Each shuddering spray drew the man or woman nearest that animal to inevitably pat or stroke it while speaking softly to comfort it as if one would to a family dog that was suffering. So I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, the catalog has the whole essay if you're interested. Um, 
so that was my day that began this incredible experience uh, of, of working on these strandings and doing the research uh, that led me to make very specific images that memorialized uh, historical strandings, very specific strandings that occurred. And one of the things that was amazing and that if you look at the work and, and read the text is how many places in the world uh, this happens and to how many species of whales, although pilots probably have the record both for single numbers of a, of a single stranding and probably total numbers, but Katie knows best on these on these matters, and I would leave that to her. Um, but it's an it's a very it was a very powerful experience for me, and uh, it led to all kinds of work. But the the biggest body of work within this exhibition is uh, the series of block prints, which, as I mentioned in my talk before, you know they draw on the the visual architecture of whaling journals. Um, I, I thought. The idea of having my journal be in the catalog essay, and, and Naomi realized this too, and encouraged me to use this, was okay, journal to journal, because the journals, the whaling journals, uh, I always thought they were very beautiful as objects, and I, you know, I, I know there have been exhibitions, and uh, I, ju I just, I thought, for me, the, the most wonderful thing would be able to show this work with, with some whaling journals in the room, so I'll, I'll stop. Can you tell us what what drew you to your current field and what that journey has been like? Um, this was not my plan. <laughs> I, uh, I studied um, coastal environmental management, so my goal in life was I was going to save all the world's coastlines from overdevelopment and things like that. And along the way, I got introduced to marine mammal strandings in the course of my graduate work. and. Um, had a similar kind of experience. Um, I didn't witness mass strandings when I first started, but it was um, witnessing um, multiple strandings in a short period of time, usually animals that were involved um, in some kind of human interaction and stranding as a result of, of human activity. And so that really drew me to want to understand more about what was happening. Um, and I, I just kind of jumped into that, and I'll say it's, it's been a hell of a ride. Um, I, moved here, moved back to Massachusetts, um, and specifically to, to southeastern Massachusetts in 1998. And that's when we first started professionalizing stranding response on Cape Cod. We were the Cape Cod Stranding Network. And uh, so we're at 25 years this month, 25 years this month. Um, and I had said um, to the folks that had hired me that I, I saw this as a two or three year gig. I would get it started and then I'd move on to do something else and that was 25 years ago. So I guess I'm in it for the long haul, but it's, it's very different now. I look at my first mass stranding um, was about two weeks into my job. I've been doing strandings for several years down in North Carolina and mostly single strandings, mostly bottlenose dolphins um, and humpback whales. And coming here, we had our first mass stranding and it was four um, Atlantic white-sided dolphins in Wealthy in Chipman's Cove. That's right. <laughs> and I can remember standing in the water, like, a, you know, the deer in headlights, like, oh my God, what have I just gotten myself into? Um, and the water was actually, it was cold. It was actually like slushy around the animals as we were working. And it was the first time I was faced with um, kind of those real life and death decisions for multiple animals at one time about what's gonna happen to those individuals and that particular day, we did refloat one of them, um, but ultimately all four ended up either dying or being humanely euthanized. Because at the time, you know, the prevailing understanding of the situation was that animals stranded for a reason. Um, and you think about dry fisheries out in Wealthy, um, pilot whales would be in close to shore. It was an easy source for whale oil, for meat, you know, it was a resource. And so people took advantage of that. Um, but in the early days, it was a oh, stranding response because over time, of course, we, we started to, you know, we have the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We're looking out for these animals. We're no longer looking at them as a resource, but as something to protect. And so that's how this whole stranding business came to be. And it was, um, when we first started out, the prevailing wisdom was these animals stranded for a reason. So they're either going to die or you should euthanize them. Do not push them back out. You're just going to cause them further suffering. Um, and over the course of the last 25 years, um, what we've discovered by both 
doing necropsies or animal autopsies on those that died or that were euthanized to try and really understand why they were on the beach and what might be wrong with them. And also doing diagnostics on the live animals and, and full exams and really you know, looking into um, each individual animal, we realized that a lot of these animals were healthy other than the impacts of the stranding itself. So we figured, okay, well, if you can treat that, think you get in a car accident, you're going into shock, they're gonna give you fluids, they're gonna keep you calm, and they're gonna do what they can for you. It's the same kind of a mentality. Um, but we really had to challenge what the policies were at the time, which was euthanasia. And um, what we found when we first started to, to really push for release and we were satellite tagging animals to try and understand if when we released them, they were actually surviving and going off and behaving as cetaceans should. And they were with our mass stranded friend. We were able to get them back out there and they were doing pretty well in most cases. So we decided to keep going. In those early years, we had about a 14% success rate. So meaning if we landed on the beach, we were able to assess the animals with the help of the many volunteers that we use. We are a volunteer driven grassroots response organization, even now, 25 years later. We rely on people that live up and down the coast. Our friends in Wellfleet are the busiest, most experienced volunteers. They're as good as staff um, because they've done it so much. Um, but with everything we learned with them, we had about a 14% success rate. If we found them alive, about 14% got back out into the wild. Over 25 years, that average is now to be about 75% they get back out alive. So huge changes um, because we've approached it um, with two things in mind. Um, we're all nerdy scientists, so we all want to understand and ask questions, and the more data we can get, and really, whaling logs were, that's data. They were just collecting data, and, and the way that they did it is a little bit different, but it's a lot of the same data points. Um, but looking at the data, we want to be scientific about it to understand what was happening and how we could do better the next day. Like, how can I save the next animal when this happens the next day? And the other piece was welfare. It's all about the welfare of the individual. We're looking big picture, but each individual in that stranding matters, so how can we do that? So I think it's been, you know, it, there's a lot that's changed over the years and we still look at it the same way. Like, okay, well, that was a good day, you know, and, and it was a good year. We had, you know, 75% of those live animals are back out there. All right, how do we get to 80% next year? That's always the question is how do you do it better? It's interesting to hear that, uh, Daniel, you've been thinking about this project for uh, about 30 years, right? And your organization is just celebrating 25 years. So thinking about that kind of arc, right? Yeah. Um, there's there's some lovely kind of harmony there. Um, I wonder, thinking about some of the description of the changes here, if you could talk a little bit, Daniel, about your historical research and sort of how you've, how you've documented the strandings and what kind of looking at the history of whaling and then also looking at the history of strandings has, has uh, meant in terms of how you've created work and thought about the project. Well, I think I, I sort of started living on the Outer Cape around 1980, 81. I, I came out there for a job and found my way to come, keep coming back and started spending summers out there. But what happened was, this is even pre-whale stuff, I started thinking a lot about natural history and natural history writing. And I read a lot of 19th century natural history writers and I realized how closely they looked at things. And I thought, well, that's what we do as artists. The first thing you have to do is look and pay attention. Um, and so I, you know, for me, I thought, well, I'm, I'm out here. And before that, for, for many years, my work had been very abstract, very formalist. Um, it was not narrative in any way. Uh, and I think once I got to the Cape, I wanted I wanted the cake to inform what I did, but there's this whole history of, I didn't want to paint lighthouses, sunsets, or I don't know, you know, there's, I, I wanted to say something about this environment that maybe hadn't been said before. Uh, we all want to do that as artists. And I think, so when, when this reading about strandings, before I'd actually experienced the one in 1991, uh, did get me thinking a little bit about it, but that 1991 stranding, I was so fortunate to be there uh, because it was in September, I was on sabbatical, I was able to stay on the Cape longer than I ordinarily would have, and uh, I don't know what our percent, I didn't do the math, but we, 21 out of the 24 whales that day survived. It was juveniles that didn't, and it was funny, uh, not funny, but 
odd that some of the professionals there that day, and Katie wasn't there, so not her, they put little red flags on the animals they were pretty sure were going to die. But you know what? All the volunteers ignored them and still kept... The main thing we did was pour water on, on their skins because it was sunny enough to dry out their skins. And, you know, and that was what the mud, when I read my... The mud was also another kind of layer of insulation. So uh, the research came about you know, because of that experience. And I thought... I started seeing these whaling journals. And I thought, God, these are beautiful. Um, but they're sad because they're killing this animal. And, and there was this irony in putting together something that was so similar to what they had done, but that now was part of championing saving whales, you know, save the whale, right? That, but that, that sort of phrase, it's kind of a metaphor. If you, save, if you can save the whales, maybe you can save the planet. Um, if you don't save the whales, maybe you don't care. Um, so for me, the research then went, okay, where do I find out about information? And of course, um, in the earliest days, the internet was just getting going and information was sporadic, but I could find news stories about strandings. And I, so I started, I started saving them all, making, you know, making, eventually making spreadsheets um, of all the strandings. One of the things that I really lucked into was somebody had done, I, I think a, a PhD student at Northeastern, you know this? Yeah, did a, a dissertation on all the whale strandings from like the 17th century to like the 1960s. So that really was the best document that I came upon uh, in the early days. And I, st I still have a, a Xerox of that. Um, and then as I went back to the work last, last year to, to, to do new work for the show, because I, I thought that would be very important to do some new work. Um, the internet, of course, had matured. And if you just do a search for whale stranding, you don't do very well. You know, you get a lot of stuff that isn't relevant. Um, you have to kind of dig deeply into particular organizations that might be gathering material. There are stranding networks in various countries around the world. And as Katie was saying, Wellfleet is really one of the hot spots. You know, I didn't know that when I decided I was going to be in Wellfleet. Um, but it, it has, there has been a lot of strandings, and uh, as, as those of you know, that big piece in the other room, 1,405 whales that stranded in Truro uh, were driven ashore. Excuse me. I always say stranded. Um, so the research, you know, was very much a part of the work, and uh, going to, beginning going to the Nantucket Whaling Museum to do research, um, which was a birthday present. Um, and you know, then having access to the library here um, for the second body of, of, of prints. Well, one of the things, Katie, you and I were talking about just out in the gallery before we started was um, how interesting it is the sort of uh, thinking about whaling logbooks and the kind of data that they carry as these records that, yes, they were based on, right, a sort of a resource on a, a business exploit. Um, and yet they carry so much sort of factual data in them, whether it's the weather or um, uh, marine mammal distribution or sightings, right? Um, and so thinking about the arc of kind of the importance of that data and how it's being used today, can you talk a little bit about what, what um, kinds of data you look at and rely on and, and um, how that informs what you do? So I, I tend to think of it in a couple of different ways. One is kind of like that, the, the individual animal level data that we're looking at. So every animal that we encounter, we're collecting as much data as we can, while at the same time, knowing that our limiting factor is the welfare of that animal. We're never gonna compromise the well-being of an animal just to get our data. That's always secondary. But as much as we can get while we're in the process of helping the animal is what we're gonna do. So everything, it's a full health assessment. When we have a, a live animal that strands now, um, they get a physical exam, so look over every surface, see if there are any wounds or injuries, any evidence of, of illness. Um, and over the years, when we first started out, it was like you got a length, you got some photos, you checked it out, you saw if there were injuries. That was it. Now, um, we do ultrasounds. Um, is the animal pregnant? How do the lungs look? Um, we're able to test its hearing. We take an echocardiogram. 
we're, we're getting um, an EKG on those on the animals to try and learn as much as we can and and apply that to our protocols and then sharing that broadly um, one of the things we're trying to do at IFON is to then take that to the next level and say, okay, how do we share what we've learned to make sure other stranding networks around the world can, can, can learn from what we've done, both the mistakes and, and the good things that we've learned um, to help animals in a much larger scale. Because while we do have an international, we are the International Fund for Animal Welfare, when a dolphin strands, you can't wait for me to fly 18 hours to get there. Um, we have done international responses, but it's, it's rare. Um, so there's that level of data that I think is really important. Um, the other piece is, it ties more to what the whaling logs were like, was looking at large scale oceanographic weather data to try and understand um, potentially what's causing these mass strandings. So Wellfleet, um, Wellfleet is the epicenter of strandings um, in this region, um, but Cape Cod and particularly Wellfleet at that epicenter is one of the top three mass stranding hotspots in the world annually. So with Australia and New Zealand, and if you look out, there's a, one of the graphics out there. We all know that this is the Cape. Well, in New Zealand, there's Farewell Spit. Yeah. They're just mirror images of each other. And so we, we have like a sister stranding organization that we collaborate with down there to say, okay, how, how does this all work? What are the similarities? What are the differences? Because the million dollar question is, why are they stranding, right? Um, I don't have that answer completely, but we're working on it. Um, the reality is that we've been working with, I mean, if you were to think about what agency would you want to work with that you think can crunch big data? NASA. So we actually got hooked up with NASA and we've had a couple of papers out with them so far because they can pull together kind of those massive data sets and look at big data from um, oceanographic buoys to satellite data and looking at the wind patterns. So it goes back to the same kinds of things that, that the whaling log works we're recording in terms of what was the weather that day, yeah. what was going on there, um, we're looking at the same things. And now we've actually brought the folks in from New Zealand and said, okay, let's do the mirror image analysis on your data set, you know, using our NASA folks to try and figure out if we're seeing the same patterns. And what we really wanted, so the first study we did, I'll just, this is a little aside, the first study we did was looking at solar storms um, to look at how, because magnetic anomalies and how that, it does, it, it impacts things on Earth. And so we're saying, we were thinking, you know, how is that, is that impacting how these animals are navigating? Is that what's driving them to all of a sudden be beaching themselves? Yeah, it wasn't that simple. It would have been great. Um, and I was really naive, and this was in probably 2000. I was like, you can go online and find data on that. Um, uh, what you do with it, I don't know, but I got it. And I was like, I'm gonna solve this. <laughs> you know? um, the NASA guys know how to use the data. And, and so we, we bridged the gap with our biology language and, and their um, you know, rocket scientist language, and uh, together we're a really good team. What we did find was that um, there is a, a likely influence of wind speed and direction being the biggest factor coming into play, but there's a lag time, and we haven't ironed out what that is. So we're trying to do the mirror image analysis to look at what those drivers might be, but there's so many variables that it's hard to pin down. Well, all my images, th those are accurate. Uh, weather data points. So, and, and I was joking about it with Tabitha when I was doing, when I was putting the weather information in because the, they weren't in the first body of pieces and I couldn't get to it so easily. But I said, well, suppose somebody looks at this and discovers the wind was always from a certain direction, or it was always cloudy, or you know, it, it, there was a certain temperature. And so, you know, one of the things in putting that information in, I, I don't. The pencil writing beneath the image is not a label. It's part of the piece. You know, it's, it, I see the pieces as historical records of something. And you know, there are ways, I suppose, artistically that one could put that information in, but I didn't, you know, I didn't want to get involved with that. So putting the data in, and I got some pushback about, oh, how much text do you want to put in? How big should the bright writing be and all of that? But I, I felt like this is, this is what I wanted in the piece. And for you know, you make these decisions, and not everybody agrees. But uh, I think it's important in in the in the work to to see that uh, and to read that. Well, and it's marrying the sort of the current science and the visual language of the historical record too, right? So that you get this really lovely, I think, kind of um, unity between 
the um, histories of whaling and the contemporary stranding response through this series of works. Um, to build upon that a little bit, can you talk about your sort of um, your artistic process or the sort of visual language of the whales and um, how you make them for, for this group? Yeah, what happens? I mean, mostly I've been a photographer as an artist, uh, but I've always been sort of operating out around the boundaries of photography. A lot of people would look at what I did and say, well, those aren't really photographs. Um, that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. So when I took this project on, I, I had never really been a printmaker. I should also say I never went to art school and I never took a, a studio art class in my life. Uh, but that's how things change, right? I'm a good self-learner. Um, so, you know, I think what I wanted to do was find out how I could, first of all, I was gonna make these stamps. All right, so what do I use? Wood? Well, wood is harder to carve. Why don't I start with something easy, like linoleum? You can buy these little linoleum pads. And, and so cutting linoleum or using a sculptural material and, and making the relief that way. Um, so I started doing all of that and I, I, wanted, I wanted the whales to be generally uh, representative of the species I was, I was uh, representing. So, you know, I would do the research for that. Okay, here's what a, a sperm whale looks like. Here's what a North Atlantic right whale looks like. Here's what a humpback whale looks like. And here's what the zillions of pilot whales look like. And so for the big piece in the other room, the 1,405 whales, somebody asked me how many different pilot whale stamps I used. And, you know, it might be eight or nine or 10 different stamps, but, you know, cutting, cutting those and then figuring out how to, how to ink them and how to make a print, make the impression look good. I mean, it took a lot of practice on sheets that weren't prepped for the final imagery. Um, but I knew I wanted, I knew I wanted to suggest the journals, um, and uh, you know, th there, are, there are other antecedents for, uh, there's Native American drawings that are on ledgers that I also think are really beautiful if you look, uh, and, and they, they have a sort of folk art quality because these are not trained um, artists, and they would often show warriors and um, warriors on horseback, but they'd be on ledger sheets because that was what they had access to as, as paper. Um, I bought some old ledgers. I didn't really like them. I didn't. I was afraid the paper would completely fall apart for one thing. So I kind of wanted these to last at least as long as I do. And uh, now that isn't so long, but you know, one point it was. Uh, so, so it, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of does that give you some idea? Yeah. So I think one of the things that I've heard from visitors to the exhibition is that um, because of the different stamps that you use and the different application of the ink, but the repetition of the body over and over again in print after print after print, that, that you do get a sense of the monumentality of the loss of life yeah. through stranding as an event that is not singular, right, but continues and continues and continues. And I think with news coverage, it's easy, you know, one stranding takes the focus and you think of it as a singular event. But can you talk, Katie, a little bit about kind of that, the um, uh, public perception of strandings versus what it's like when you sort of live in that world. I think one of the one of the best things is that people people tend to really care. So when you're out on the beach, people are interested. They want to be a part of it. They want to help in whatever way they can. So I think public perception is very sympathetic and supportive. Um, somewhat emotional sometimes with folks on the beach, especially as animals are dying. Um, from a perspective of living it every day, um, it's it's something where we, you have to compartmentalize. Um, we consider ourselves first responders, so in order to do my job well, I have to kind of put my emotions in a box, at least initially, to do the analysis that I need to do to understand what's going on and, and to make good decisions. Um, but uh, you can't always do that. It's, it's, I mean, we're all human and you can't always keep that box closed. I think probably one of the most significant events was um, 2002, we had 56 pilot whales in, um, oh my God, Corporation Beach, Dennis, on the 29th of July at about seven in the morning. <clears throat> I don't need a log for that one. That one's 
emblazoned in my brain. That was that's the biggest one I've ever been to personally. Um, and uh, all of these pilot whales stranded, and we got the call from the um, uh, natural resource officers in the town, and I was a single staff member at the time. We didn't have anybody else, and so I was like, okay. And he's like, there's like, there's like a handful of pilot whales, and I was like, oh dear lord, what am I going to do with a handful of pilot whales? And we, I, I called the New England Aquarium because I was kind of, kind of like, think of fire departments with mutual aid. I called them like, oh my god, send help. And so one of their folks was close by, came right into the office where I was in Velvet's Bay, and said, okay, let's, let's get on the road. And as we're gearing up, we have one big flatbed trailer with a big air mattress on it, and a, and a pickup truck with a bunch of stretchers and like a toolkit. And this was early days, and. We got out there. As we're driving, they're calling us back saying, oh, it's like 15. I was like, 15 pilot whales? I was like, you has got to be kidding me. And you know, we're pulling in, and he's he's calling down. He's like, no, there's like 50 animals here. I was like, shut up. <laughs> um, we got there, and then literally we stood there. on, on I stood on the, the hood of the truck so I could see everything on the beach. And um, it was overwhelming. And it was the hottest day of the summer. Those animals were suffering in the sun. Um, we didn't have the well fleet mud. To, to use as kind of a sunscreen, so we knew that they were suffering. Um, we were able to euthanize a couple of animals that really needed it, um, but like that, they, they're in these clusters. So you have clusters of very large, very powerful animals that are pretty much on top of each other. So getting up close to them to try and give aid is dangerous. And one false move and you're significantly hurt. And so we were trying to keep the public safe, so we had them, we had bucket brigades and things like that. It was, um, in the moment, it was all business, and we were trying to get as many animals saved as we could. Um, and it, the, the tide came in, and we refloated 46 animals that day. Others had died or been euthanized. We refloated 46, and the next day they showed up in Wealthy. Yep. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god. It's back cheap, sir. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, when you think about the Cape, if you if you've ever been out in, if you're in Dennis or Brewster, or any of those places. At low tide, you're going to walk a half mile to a mile to get water deep enough to swim in. These animals are offshore animals. They are not used to a tidal fluctuation, so the tide goes right up underneath them. But then it comes rushing back in. And so they refloated and went off, but they had been in the sun all day. They had been supporting their own weight all day. We didn't, there were so many that we couldn't even, we didn't know what we know now in terms of first aid and triage and, and emergency care. So we would do it differently now, but with 56 animals, you then have to really triage and say, okay, what can we realistically do and who can we save? And I think that's what weighs on you. And that event went on for, they stranded that second day in, um, it was near, it might've been Blackfish, it might've been the tip of Blackfish where they came in. And uh, it was mud, it was horrible, it was difficult. And every single one of those animals either died or was euthanized that day. And we called every vet on the Cape for every ounce of euthanasia solution to put those animals down because there was, I mean, they were, their skin was just falling off. It was horrible. Oh, right. And then we were like, well, now what do we do? Now we've got total, we had taken some of the animals to a landfill for necropsy. So um, Michael Moore had been doing necropsies that, that next day. And we were out trying to deal with this second round of strandings. And we couldn't leave them because they had euthanasia solution. That's poison. So any scavengers that come in are now going to eat them and they're going to die. So now we have a, a toxic waste issue. Um, we ended up having to, to take 46 carcasses offshore the next day um, with a lovely fishing boat out of New Bedford, um, towing them offshore and sinking them. Um, and, and it was after that, so that's like three or four days in, is when you, you know, we finally had a chance to kind of process what had happened and that was, you know, I think the long-term day-to-day, it never ends. Our jobs never end. The strandings never stop. There's strandings every day. We have, on average, well, in any, over the last 25 years, we've had from two to 30 mass strandings, mass strandings. Um, that doesn't include all the single strandings plus all the, the um, seals that strand that we respond to. So it's, it's never ending, and I think the, the bright spot for us is we're able to save so many more animals. And it's not, there's a selfish piece to that. It's not, it's great that they're saved. That is brilliant and that is our goal. Um, but there's nothing worse than feeling like you're playing God when you have to put an animal down. It's, it's not, 
it's not somebody's pet, they're not making a decision. We're making a decision on an animal that's, that's in front of us. And I think there's a, a real burden that comes with that that weighs heavily on, on all of the team members, volunteers and staff alike. Well, one of the things um, that you spoke about too, and, and, and I had definitely the experience of the huddling thing too, and we both have talked about that. But um, when you walk past the animals, um, the eye of the animal will actually follow you. And so, you know, we're told not to anthropomorphize too much with these situations, but these are, these are pretty intelligent mammals, um, big brains, and uh, they communicate with one another. I've been fascinated recently because there's some people doing work using AI to try and process uh, communication, the clicks and the, and the sounds that they make. And, and there, were, there were sounds that day. There were, they were um, clickings and other kinds of sounds. Um, you, you definitely had a sense that they knew what was going on. They knew that maybe we were trying to help them, but that seems to be the case with entanglements now that um, the, the rescuers who go right and end up on top of the animals at sea cutting away uh, lines. So, you know, one of the things I really hoped would happen would we would, we would see that these animals um, are more like us, they're not the enemy. And doing that body of work out there, um, was, was part, that was part of my hope. It was such a, a reversal of what had come before, where we nearly, you know, drove them to extinction, maybe not pilot whales, but there's what, 340 uh, North Atlantic right whales left. And they're not reproducing in, in enough numbers to sort of sustain that population, or it's close, it's marginal. Um, so, you know, the, to me, this is this is very important. And I think as an artist, a few years ago, I guess I just decided that I wanted my work to have some impact on how people saw the environment. Um, everything else, it seems so important as politicians stand up and say, oh, it's the, the existential problem of our time, and then they don't do anything. Um, so I think as, as an artist, you do what you can, but you want to make beautiful things. You want to make things that move people. Um, so there's a balance, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I wrote to a couple of places and said this, this beautiful show, are you interested in it? And I would always say, there's no photographs of dead whales, <laughs> you know, because I was sure people would say, oh, whale string, it's going to be a really gross exhibition, you know, but I don't think you get that feeling out there. Um, it's, it's celebratory. It's not, you know, it can be, it can be painful to see it. Um, there are both sides to that. Well, I wonder if uh, any members of our audience have questions here for, for Daniel, for Katie, for both. Um, it looks like Beatrice has a microphone, if anyone has one. I probably don't need the microphone, though. Just so the camera can Oh. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Hello. Um, so this question is for Katie. Um, it feels like a really silly question, but having grown up around the ocean and very appreciative of all cetaceans and uh, uh, all creatures in the water, um, I just find it so hard to believe that these intelligent species are doing it accidentally. And I guess my question to you is, is it been ruled out that it's not on purpose that some of these strandings are happening? I don't think we can rule anything out. I mean, short of getting inside their heads, like they are intelligent animals. So, you know, I can remember early in, the, in my stranding days having someone approach me on the beach and be like, you know what? They're just, they're committing suicide. This is what they're doing. And, and it's population management. And I was like, oh, I, I don't have an argument against that. Um, you know, uh, the things I can refute are when people are like, oh, it's, it's Navy sonar. You know, when there, was, when there were big issues in the early 2000s with Navy sonar, then every stranding became due to Navy sonar. And I was like, well, that I can refute because I can tell you that on the Cape, these mass strandings have been happening since pre-industrialized pre -industrialized ocean. So I know that it's a naturally occurring thing. I can't get at the why. Um, can I definitively say no, but I just, ugh. You know, one of the, the things that I will say is that we were, when we release animals, some animals get a satellite tag. They're super expensive. We can't tag every single animal, nor do we need to. 
Um, but every animal, we're mandated to, to mark the animals, and so they all get um, a cattle ear tag, the same kind of tag that, that livestock get. Um, and those pull out over time. They go in the dorsal fin on the trailing edge, and it's like putting it in your ear. It's like getting an earring. But when they pull out, they give a notch. So a lot of times, if, if you're, there are certain species that tend to have, you know, they bite on each other. Like bottlenose dolphins that are coastal in the southern states um, are very tactile. They'll bite on each other, and so they'll they'll break across each other's dorsal fins, and they'll leave these marks. Well, when we're looking at pilot whales or Atlantic white-sided dolphins or the common dolphins that we see stranded here, the trailing edge of their dorsal fins are pristine, not a mark. And I can tell you, we have tagged in one form or another, you know, God, thousands of animals. And I'm not seeing them come back. Now, we do have three strandings. There's a small percentage of those live animals that come back in um, and, and restrand, usually right away. We don't see them two years later or a year later. But what I'm not seeing is like the frequent flyers who keep doing it. So I feel like, you know, I don't know, is there a learning curve? Do they go off? Evidently, they don't communicate it to other pods because we still have other animals coming in, but I'm not seeing what I think would be the same animals coming in. So I think it's a really good question. And if you, you know, if there's a way to answer it, I'm all for it. I hope that's not it. Oh, thank you. In one of the pieces up there, I, I actually used the word suicide. Um, not that I knew that that was the case any more than you do, but I think, as Katie has said, there are a lot of theories. The worst one of the moment is the wind turbines, which the right has decided that they want fossil fuels, of course. So. Um, the wind turbines have been, everybody I know in the field says, this is ridiculous, you know, no, no possibility. There's a lot of misinformation out there on that, for sure. I do think, I'll just pick up on that for a minute, because I do think as a sort of artistic choice, the use of that term, it's a provocation. It's, I do think there's a, uh, in terms of reception, almost a passivity to stranding in a way of like people, I don't know, people who maybe haven't experienced or haven't witnessed one, it um that 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 use of the word maybe encourages an audience a, a visitor to think differently about the event perhaps i don't know yeah yeah i always used to say that you know it, it's not that these animals are throwing themselves on the beach they're not i mean when they're stranding for the most part and there are like when we have single strandings you know when you have a social cetacean, any dolphin that's from a social species coming ashore by itself, obviously there's there's your first nod that something's probably wrong because it shouldn't be alone. Um, but I was just saying, you know, they're not throwing themselves on the beach. A lot of times they're just coming into these areas that they don't frequent. I mean, these are offshore animals. So coming into Cape Cod Bay is not where they should be, though they are frequently. And sometimes they come in and out. You know, we've, we've had the ability through some folks at Woods Hole to come put a buoy off of um, wealthy harbors to listen and we're like okay early warning system if you can flag when groups of pilot whales and dolphins are coming into wealthy harbor oh my god i mean to get out ahead of it is amazing because the other piece that we try to do is mass training prevention so we use pingers and boats so pingers are about this big um smaller now because technology um but when i first started out they're about this big and they're used by fishermen to reduce bycatch of cetaceans in their nets it's a great tool um, so we decided, why couldn't we use it? If we know animals are in an area where they could strand, Wellfleet being the biggest hotspot, couldn't we use it to drive them back out offshore? So that's another piece of what we try to do, and using that and just vessel, vessel motions to herd them offshore is, is another piece to what we're trying to do to get them out there. Can you comment on the northern right whale situation, how it's coming along? Um, and I know it's grim, um, but as from your organization, seeing it move forward or backward or however. Absolutely. Um, I would say there's a, there's a glimmer of hope. Um, all is not lost. Um, but the way it stands right now, so the new numbers just came out. The new um, population estimate is standing at like three, 56 or 354 
Um, and all that did was it adjusted for calves born, like they don't count a calf as part of the population estimate until it's a year old. It has to live that first year because there's such a high infant mortality, if you will. Um, but so they've, they've incorporated that as well as some of the losses. Um, but the reality is that um, one of the metrics that we use to look at how well we're doing is PBR or potential biological removal. So that means how many right whales could we lose due to human causes and still have the population be on a path to recovery and still be able to recover, have enough animals for it to recover. Um, that number is 0.7. You can lose less than one. That's how many we can afford to lose. So that, you know, that statistic hasn't changed. And the way that the demographics are right now, there's about 70 reproductive females in that population, 70. That's a big burden. And normally their reproductive um, cycle, they would have a calf every three to four years. They're now calving every seven to nine years. So it's a very slow process. There are so many factors that go into this climate change, you know, affecting prey distribution, affecting where those animals go. And, you know, the way that we can protect them, looking at the data set, so IFA actually holds the, the necropsy data set, so all the dead right whales we catalog. Um, and the majority of animals die because of either entanglement or ship strike. So we're working on entanglement by using ropeless fishing gear, working with the industry on that one. Now the other piece of that is up for um, change right now. There's a NOAA rule amendment that's been proposed. It's been out for public comment. There are 90,000 comments that they're, they're combing through. And it's to um, kind of increase the protections. We already have um, basically speed reduction rules up and down the East Coast. So these animals move up and down the East Coast. They calve down south, come up, feed up off of Canada, and then make their way back down. And um, we're just trying to, they're trying to, you know, learn from, from what they've observed. The animals are moving into slightly different places. Um, they're being struck by, right now, the only ships that have to abide by the rule are 65 feet and longer, um, where they're trying to increase it. So any vessels 35 feet and longer have to abide by those rules when in those zones at those times. So it's not high season for us. It's not high, you know, like tourist season. It's, it's outside of that. So there are things that we're, we're still working on, but the, the way the models look right now, um, if we don't change something, the species will be functionally extinct by 2035. 2035, my daughter will be 25 years old. That's, which is frightening in and of itself, but, <laughs> but that's around the corner, really. So, you know, it's one of those things where right now that population estimate coming up just a little bit, that's great. That's a great data point, but one point is not a trend to make. So that we have a little bit of a plateau and we'll, we'll grasp onto that, but if we don't start taking this more seriously then, and, and, and finding that balance, like bringing the stakeholders in, working with the shipping industry, working with all the fishermen to say, okay, you know, I eat fish. I don't want to not have fish on my plate, but I, I don't want to kill all the right whales either. Sorry, that wasn't as uplifting as I would have liked to have been able to say. <laughs> hi, Katie. Hi, hi Dan. So, Katie, um, you mentioned EKGs and other things, tools that have been used for people. Just thinking about new tools that have come along in the past few years purposefully made for strainings. Like for example, you have these carts with these giant in inflatable tires, one of which IFO has donated here to the museum. Same with the dolphins stretcher downstairs. Has anything else been created specifically for strainings? Yeah, you know, and that's the other great thing about technology and the internet is that we're all connected. The world seems much smaller in many ways. So the good thing is we're sharing a lot of information with other groups. For us personally, um, the, the biggest changes for us, certainly all the diagnostic tools, um, we do have the most amazing mobile rescue unit now. We call it Moby, the Great White Whale, because <laughs> it is enormous and it's white. Uh, but it can hold up to nine dolphins um, at a time um, because, being the Cape, we don't want to release animals back into the bay. They're all stranded here. If we release them there, they tend to restrand. So we transport to the outer Cape um, obviously with 56 pilot wells or something like that, we're not going to move them all, but 
we have found that if, when we do that, animals um, have a much greater chance of survival and successfully reintegrating into the wild. So that is one of our biggest tools. Um, we're at a point now where we've been really testing like what is healthy. Um, a lot of the data that we have on cetaceans comes from captive animals. That's kind of not real. I mean, it, it's, it's real for other captives, but if we're talking about wild animals, how do we know what, what is really healthy? And so when we first started putting out satellite tags, we would put these satellite tags on the healthiest, strongest animals, figuring they can handle the bit of added trauma um, of the tag and of the drag on that. Um, but what we do now is actually look at those animals that are kind of borderline. Like, we don't want to euthanize it because we really think it's, it's, it could be OK, but we're concerned. Um, and so we'll tag that one to see how it does. And excuse <coughs> me. <coughs> It's those in-between animals that, that we're trying to define, like where is healthy, where is healthy enough to put you back out. But we can't get all the data that we need. We have a window, you know, if a stranding happens, we try to get them back in the water as fast as we possibly can. So all the health assessments that we're doing are happening in that big vehicle as we transit an hour or hour and a half to the release site. We don't always get all the information we need and we're realizing that you know, the more animals we tag that way and take the chance on, we're getting more animals that are restraining or the tags are failing. So we're not getting a signal after a day. So we, then is it, did the tag fail or did the dolphin fail? Um, so we actually have a new dolphin rescue center out in Orleans, which is going to be, basically we call it our, our cetacean intensive care unit, our SICU. Mm -hmm. And it's just for like five day holding so that we can stabilize the animal, give it the meds it needs, give it fluids, try and see if we can get it healthy. At the same time, try to understand what the physiological mechanism is that is compromising that animal so that we can better diagnose it in the field and do a better job of treatment and, and immediate release in the future. So those are the biggest things. I think um, when, when we talk to stranding folks, um, we just had a team in Brazil in the Amazon dealing with Amazon river dolphins that are having issues because of drought, <clears throat> getting trapped in a tributary. And one of the things we always say is you don't have to have the fanciest equipment in the world to do really amazing work. If you have a camera, a pad and a paper, and a measuring, um, measuring tape and things like that, you can learn a lot about an animal um, just from that physical exam. So, but we are always looking at what's new in the, in the tech field, but some of the simplest stuff is, is the key there. Does that answer you, Bob? Yes, thank you. Any other questions for speakers? Um, as far as the data from the past data, do you um, have any sense of the keepers of that information? What, what were there certain people people who were the artists who, you know, kept the logs, the journals? In terms of the whaling journals? Uh -huh. We usually, the journal was kept by either the captain or the first mate, I think. Mm -hmm. um, some were called logs and some were called journals for different um, reasons. I think there's a hierarchy there, but I may have forgotten it. Um, and, you know, I think that trying to do the research, one of the things you realize is that there are these hot spots. And Farewell Spit in New Zealand, which Katie mentioned before, recently had a 250 or 300 animal stranding um, pilot whales. Um, and, you know, that one kept popping up. Tasmania, um, the North Sea, those were all places that I would see multiple. Romo, Denmark, which I've never been to. I have no idea what the configuration of the shoreline is. But, but I, think, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of possible explanations. But anybody who knows these tidal flats, and the Cape is new, you know, um, geologically, it's 10,000 years old or something on that order of magnitude. I, I sometimes think, well, maybe their GPS just hasn't been updated, you know? <laughs> that they're used to, they've got memories that go back 100,000 years, 200,000 years, and the Cape wasn't on the map, you know? Who put this here? Uh, so, I, I mean, you know, it's, it, I think, I loved when Katie said, well, we don't know what they are, and we're open to listening to any, I mean, that's a bizarre, uh, idea, and I don't mean to really present it as possible, but 
Um, it, it is funny when you realize you're on this piece of land, and I don't know how young farewell spit is, but typically a spit that's, that's created that way into a semicircle will eventually make a circle, according to the geologists. Um, and, you know, it tends to be younger than, I mean, I remember standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and reading that it's like 5 billion years old, and I'm thinking, I come from a place that's 10,000 years old. You know, it's just a kid, you know, not even an infant. So, uh, you know, I think that that's part of it too, is that, you know, you look at these places and as you do the research and it's, it, you know, there's some things that were just newspaper stories or some things that, um, you know, you just hope you can find out the information. Um, and I've had help sometimes from some of the stranding organizations that have provided information. But I don't think it was artists that was mo there were most, and, and I think on the ships, they weren't necessarily artists, although and of, oftentimes sailors would make these beautiful valentines, the sailors' valentines, the scrimshaw. When you look at all the work that was done, um, it's not surprising that the journals have an aesthetic quality. Um, they're, you know, they're not hand-fisted, they're, they're beautiful. Um, Thinking about geological time and the sort of uh, arc of the project, uh, looking from 1991 to now in the exhibition, do you have a sense of what's next with this series? Or are there things left unexplored for you here? Will it continue? You know, I never know. Um, I never say something's finished um, because I might have thought this was finished, um, but then I had this idea that I wanted to work off of the original journals and I wanted the weather data and I felt there was, I, w I won't do them again until I think I can bring something new to it. Um, and I, I will always have my eyes open and my ears open. And, um, you know, I'm just glad that this work got to be shown in this venue. To me, that I, I said that already, but I, I can't say it often enough, and Tabitha has heard me say this as well, it's like, this is what, you know, this is where it should be. Um, and, you know, um, I, I, I think people who come here probably appreciate it, and maybe some of the people who come don't go to art museums, but I hope they, I hope they're moved by, by this work. So, and I hope you all have been as well. Well, Thank you all for joining us. I think we're just at the top of the hour here. So um, we'll open up the reception. There's refreshment. Um, we'll be here to continue the conversation that if, if anyone's interested. And of course, the galleries are open behind you to go and look at this exhibition uh, as you enjoy the next hour of our reception. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you to Katie and Dan.